Hello and welcome to another video in the series Archaeology and Islam. My name is Dan Gibson and today we want to examine the question, was Muhammad a real historical figure? Let me start by saying that while I have researched the history of Mecca and the archaeology of Arabia, I have never tried to cast doubt that Muhammad existed. I believe he did exist. The only changes I'm suggesting are geographical ones and how they impact the account of early Islam. But I hear many objections to my theory and most of them are around the existence of Muhammad. But I'm not like some scholars who doubt the existence of Muhammad. I believe he was a real person. I hope this is clear to everyone. I think about half of the objections I receive such as those from Adnan Ibrahim, deal with this topic. But he totally misunderstands what I'm saying. He puts me together with a group of other revisionists who want to disprove that Muhammad existed. I'm not one of those. I have never said anything against the historicity of Muhammad. Now, I'm very aware of scholars from many different backgrounds and different specialities who dealt the existence of ancient figures. For years, I have dealt with people who dealt the existence of Jesus. They dealt the reliability of the Bible. They even dealt the existence of God. They doubt and cast doubt, and it seems like they think it's my responsibility to prove things to them before they'll accept it. But how about if we turn the question around and I ask them to prove that someone did not exist? Can they do that? How do you prove someone didn't exist? Now, let's talk about proof for a minute. When archaeologists dig up ancient things, they often uncover things that were only written about previously. The people of Thamud seem to be imaginatory until we discovered various kinds of Thamudic writing, such as from Tema or Hisma. Now, let me explain this with a different example. In the 1700s and the early 1800s, it was popular for people to doubt and question the authenticity of the Bible. They said that the Bible was full of mythical civilizations, and that the writers of the Bible made up names of mythical people groups uh, around their imagination, just made them up. This was used as proof that the Bible was just a bunch of nonsense. Some proposed the idea that a lot of the Old Testament was written in Babylon just a few hundred years before the time of Jesus. One of the popular examples back then, we're talking the 1700s, was the civilization known in the Bible as the Hittites. The whole existence of Hittites was scoffed at. It was just another made-up Bible story. Only the Bible talked about the Hittites. There was no other civilization that had myths and legends about the Hittites, and there was no mention of them outside of the biblical record. Then, in 1834, a French explorer came across the ruins of a vast city with a large gate and two lion statues at the gate. He found this in the middle of Turkey. Scholars didn't think it was all that important as they couldn't fit it into what was known about ancient civilizations, so his report was overlooked. About the same time, archaeological digs in the middle uh, excavated cuneiform clay tablets that hinted at a lost ancient empire. It wasn't until 1887 that excavations at Tel el Amarna in Egypt uncovered diplomatic correspondence of Pharaoh Amenhotep III and his son with reference to the land of the Hatti, which was unknown to archaeologists. This led to speculation. Maybe there was another ancient empire in the Middle East, and there was a lot of debates going on. On one side, they argued maybe this was the ancient Hittites mentioned in the Bible. On the other side, they argued that the Bible's just full of myths. It couldn't be them. Scholars had already decided that there were only three great empires in the ancient world, Egypt, Assyria, and Babylon. 
They insisted that groups like the Israelites didn't exist or weren't very important people. They were insignificant, whose account was full of myth and full of mythical names. Then in 1905, archaeological digs started in Turkey, and Hugo Winkler, professor of the Oriental Languages at the University of Berlin, asked his colleagues throughout the world to let him know if they found any examples of any unknown ancient languages. Then, from the dig sites, the archaeologists began to collect more and more clay tablets with this strange language written on it. More and more Hittite cities were found. In the end, it became clear that a huge ancient Hittite empire really did exist. Now, why do I bring this up? Well, the writers of the Old Testament tell us a lot about Hittites. But the Hittite nation disappeared from history and from the historical record, and by 600 BC, it was totally forgotten. No one claimed to know anything about the Hittites except the Bible. So it became popular to say the Bible had made up stories in it. But now we know the truth. Now my question is, if the Hittites disappeared from known history... How did so much information about the Hittites end up in the Bible? They're mentioned during the time of Abraham, and during the time of Moses, and during the time of King David. If the Bible was made up so much later, how did the writers at that time even know that the Hittites existed? Instead of disproving the Bible, for me at least, it seems to prove the Bible, it seems to prove it's a very ancient text. Even to this date, I hear university professors casting doubt on the Bible because it contains mythical civilizations. The argument still seems to hang on, even though it collapsed a long time ago. So I urge you, do not be discouraged about people who doubt the existence of Muhammad. Archaeologists are only now beginning to uncover things. Doubting the existence of someone is not proof that they never existed. Let me repeat that. Doubting the existence of something or someone is not proof that they never existed. It's not your responsibility to have to defend the existence of Muhammad. It's their responsibility to prove that he never existed. They can question all they want, but how can they prove he never existed? You will find everywhere you go people who doubt the existence of the prophets. This has been the case from the very beginning. They ask, did the prophets exist? They ask, who is a true prophet? Now those are two very important questions. People will question the existence of King David, and we will look at the archaeology of David in another video. There are people who question the existence of Solomon, and we will look at the archaeology of Solomon in another video. There are people who question the existence of Abraham, and we will look at the archaeology of Abraham in another video. People question the existence of Moses, and we will look at the archaeology of Moses in another video. We have lots of videos that we're planning in this series. So do not be surprised when people question the existence of prophets. So how do we tell if an ancient people existed? Now here are five things we can look at. This is my list and these are my five criteria that I like to analyze things by. First of all, does their actual name, is it written on ancient material such as coins or inscriptions? Second, um, are, is the existence of these people acknowledged by the surrounding nations? Third, is there a large body of people that came out of this time that support it? Fourth, is there a large body of literature? And then fifth, supporting circumstantial evidence. Now, this is my own list, not something I copied from somewhere. So let's apply these five criteria to the person of Muhammad. Is his actual name written on ancient material? Now here are the opponents uh, of the existence of Muhammad. They jump up and down and claim victory. They claim that we cannot find the name of Muhammad written anywhere in stone or on coins during the life of Muhammad. Now this is also claimed against the existence of Jesus and John the Baptist and so on. Show us a coin, they shout. Then we'll believe. Well, 
none of the prophets were in the business of making coins. They were not pushing their own agendas. They came as spokespersons for God. None of the founders of the world's great religions have anything written about them during their own lifetime. So it is not any surprise that we find this true about Muhammad. None of the earliest Islamic coins mention Muhammad, as Muhammad only ruled in Arabia. Now, as the Muslim armies moved out of Arabia, they didn't mint coins, they simply used the coins that were already in existence in those countries. There was no need to mint new coins. When you captured a city, you captured all of the coins in that city. So it wasn't until the time of Abd al-Malik, who focused on building the infrastructure of the Islamic world, that we start to find Muslim coins. It was Abd al-Malik who focused on uniting the people together. Up until his time, Greek was commonly used as well as Arabic. Uh, he was the first ruler to insist that Arabic be used as a common language and that all rules and laws be written in Arabic. He was the one who struggled to unite the Muslims, who at that time had two different Qiblas. We can see this from the history of the Qiblas. And so he united them so they agree on one Qibla in Saudi Arabia. He built many of the first buildings in Mecca in Saudi. And so it comes as no surprise that the first coins that Abdul Malik had minted had both Greek and Arabic written on them. What did they write on the coins? Muhammad's name? No. They used a large capital M for the Greek side. And they uh, have this big M and then the Arabic writing around it. Soon after that, we find the Arabic shahada, or the witness, appearing on coins. So while we do not find the name of Muhammad on the very earliest coins, we find a large M on coins 90 years after Muhammad's life. So from this point on, we have coins that substantiate the existence of the caliphs with clear Islamic writings. Now, what about the surrounding nations? Byzantine Syria was aware of Muhammad within two years of his death, at the very latest. Uh, Sebios, the church bishop who was alive during the time of Muhammad, wrote that the Arab invasion of Syria was between 632 and 634. He mentions that a false prophet had appeared among the Sarsians and dismisses Muhammad as an impostor on the ground that prophets do not come with a sword and chariots. In chapter 30 of his books, uh, Sebios tells us that Muhammad gathered his army and they set out from the Paran Desert and apparently marched towards the Moabite Rabbah where, there, where they met the armies of the Byzantines. This would have been at Muta, just as the Islamic records tell us. But there's an, one major difference. In the Islamic records, it says they left from Medina and Mecca. In Sebios, they leave from Paran. This is very significant because Paran spans the area west and east of Wadi Araba, which includes the region of Petra. This entire area, both east and west of Wadi Araba, has been called Paran by ancient writers and was home to the ancient Nabataean people. Sebius is quite clear that the armies left from this area, while the Islamic writers speak of Mecca and Medina. How can this be rectified? Well, let's read some more. Later in the same chapter, Sebius notes that it talks about the second wave of Arab armies under Umar that came from the deserts of Sinai, not from Mecca or Medina in Arabia. When the sons of Ishmael had written and issued forth from the desert of Sinai, this is Sebius writing, their king Umar did not accompany them. Once again, he locates the source of Muslim armies as coming from the north of Arabia, this time he calls Paran the Sinai. As we know, Nabataeans, those ancient people, originated in the area of Paran, and while the Nabataean capital was at Petra, they had other cities in the Negev and the Sinai. So Sebios once again identifies northern Arabia as the homeland of the Arabs. He does not attribute this to Medina or Mecca in Saudi Arabia. Now, many Muslims use these passages to argue about the existence of Muhammad.
but they miss the importance of the geography of this section. Sebios supports the idea of northern Arabia being the center of the Muslims. Now, there is another Armenian writer, Thomas Arts Rooney, who writes before his death in 887, and he tells us this. He says, At that time, in a place of Petria Arabia Perrin, named Mecca, the Mecca, he showed himself to brothers, bandits, warriors, and band chiefs, worshipping in a temple. From this it is clear that the Prophet Muhammad was not born and raised in Mecca and Saudi Arabia, but that he lived in the city of Mecca in Paran in Arabia Petria. Here the writer clearly calls it the Mecca and places it in southern Jordan. Now listen carefully. Thomas Arts Rooney gives the city two names. First he calls it Petria Arabia Paran. This is the Greek name. And then he tells us the Arabic name for the city, Mecca, the Mecca. Why does he emphasize this? Because by the time of his writing, Petra, known as Mecca, is abandoned, and Mecca in Saudi Arabia is the only Mecca still in existence. Please understand the importance of this. As we have said before, the city of Petra had two names. To the Greeks, it was known as Petra, but to the Arabs, the city of Petra was known as Mecca, and Thomas Arts Rooney says, the Mecca, just so you know for sure it's the same thing. It was not unusual for ancient cities to have different names given by different people at different times. So the Islamic records are not untrue when they talk about Muhammad and Mecca, because Petra and Mecca at that time were the same place. So when we read Islamic writings, we must remember that Mecca in Paran became and moved to become Mecca in Saudi Arabia. This is why my survey of early Islamic Qiblis is important because it indicates when this change took place, when we should understand that the literature is referring to Petra or to Mecca because both were known as Mecca. So, which one is it? You must know the dates, and you must look at the Qiblas to determine when that change took place. Now, a third evidence is a large group of supporting people at the time. Uh, we're back now talking about the historicity of Muhammad. Not only are there coins shortly after his death, uh, but there is evidence from surrounding nations within two or three years after Muhammad's death. Now, a third test is a question, is there only a single or a few mention of uh, this person, or is there a large body of people who support this? Well, listen, within a hundred years of his death, there were so many followers of Muhammad, they had spread his name and his message over a very wide area, from Morocco all the way to Afghanistan. If you come and tell me some obscure fact from ancient history, and no one speaks of it or quotes of it afterwards, then I might doubt it. But if within a couple of years there are large crowds of people who attest to it and who are willing to fight and even die for it, then it's worth considering. In the same way, when we question or we hear of questions of the historicity of Jesus, within a few short years there were thousands of people who were willing to testify and die for him. This stands for something, should not be easily dismissed. Now, a fourth consideration is if there's a large body of supporting ancient literature. We have not only the hadiths and the histories written 250 years after the death of Muhammad, but there are also letters and personal correspondence of people who wrote about Muhammad and about Islam. And today there's a very large body of supporting literature. The only way I can explain the existence of this literature is that Muhammad was a literal historical figure. Now last, what about other supporting evidences? For example, there are inscriptions written on rocks northwest of Taif in Saudi Arabia that are dated 78 years after the Hijra. These inscriptions include verses of the Quran, supplications, asking for forgiveness, for mercy, martyrdom, and paradise, 
trust and belief in the Prophet Muhammad and name him, and the sending of prayers and blessings upon him. One inscription stands out, as it contains the full shahada, or the testimony, and also mention of the building of Masjid al-Haram that year. We've talked about this before in other videos. This is only 78 years after the Hijrah, and so Muhammad is named in a dated rock inscription. Now, Dr. Sia Pestein is a doctor in, uh, the, in Leiden University, and she tells us from her research of papyri, shortly after Muhammad's death, there is mention of the Hajj, there is mention of Zakat, which is the collection of uh, tax, and she has also come across papyrus uh, texts written about 725, which name both the Prophet Muhammad and Islam. Now, another argument for the existence of Muhammad is that when we go to the Middle East, we find the names of ancient people and their gods that are mentioned in Islamic records. Thamud is there. So is the uh, inscriptions that mention Dushera, Al-Lat, al usa and others, just like the ancient Islamic records tell us. Now, I argue that these are all found in Northern Arabia, but my argument is really only about geography. I don't claim that Muhammad did not exist. So what about people who argue that Muhammad never existed? Ask them to prove that Muhammad never existed. That's much harder to do. Do people make up fictional leaders and then fight and die for them? Give us one example where we know for sure that this happened in ancient history. No, people don't die for fictional characters. If Muhammad was just a made-up fictional leader, do you not think that the Byzantines would have caught on and they would have argued about his existence? We have records of a debate that took place between Leo III, he was a Byzantine emperor, who was arguing with the Caliph Umar II over whose religion was right. This is only 85 years after the death of Muhammad. Did the Byzantines argue that Muhammad was just another made-up fictional character? No. They argued that General Hajjaj had written great parts of the Quran, and he had added those parts to what Muhammad had revealed. This is repeated several times from several different sources, and Umar doesn't deny it. But the existence of Muhammad is never questioned. Now, 1,300 years later, there are scholars who want to question the existence of Muhammad. I'm sorry. From all of this, I conclude that it seems obvious to me that there is sufficient evidence to support that Muhammad was a literal, historical figure. The question that people should really ask is, was Muhammad a true prophet? And what are the marks of a true prophet? But that will be the subject of another video sometime in the future. I'm Dan Gibson, and this has been another video in the series Archaeology and Islam.